Okay, sorry. Yes, no problem. Good afternoon. This is Rita Riccardi, Director of Retirement Plans for Gateway Retirement Consulting. Welcome to our monthly webinar. Today's webinar is entitled Identity Theft, Protecting Your Data and Dollars, and will be recorded. At Gateway Retirement Consulting, we are a full-service pension consulting firm. We offer fiduciary support, fee benchmarking, investment analysis, target date fund consulting, and plan design assessments to enhance participant retirement outcomes. Our next monthly webinar in our monthly series is scheduled for July 23rd and is entitled Understanding and Planning for Long-Term Care. We also offer access to our Best of Gateway Retirement Consulting webinar topics, including the SECURE Act and Data Privacy, Women and Wealth, Transforming Social Security into a Winning Retirement, Coronavirus and Recent Market Volatility, and Fiduciary Failures. You can access our monthly webinars by checking out our YouTube channel at Gateway Retirement Consulting. Today's webinar is being presented by our partner, Jen Mulroney. Jen is Vice President and Regional Retirement Consultant for American Century Investment. Jen has been in the financial services industry for over 25 years. She spent 25 years at Prudential Retirement and was responsible for new business development for the defined contribution and defined benefits markets. Jen currently leads the marketing committee on the Women in Pension Network National Board. Now I will turn it over to Jen. Thank you, Rita. And thank you to everyone at Gateway for inviting me to be part of your webinar series. As Rita mentioned, I'm here to talk about identity theft today. And first, I wanna go through the topics that we're going to cover. This is an important topic, and there's three main items that we'll cover today. First is the most common types of identity theft and how thieves obtain your personal information. Next, the multiple ways we are at risk every day and how we can protect ourselves and others that we care about. And finally, what to do if you become a victim of identity theft and the critical resources and information you need to take swift actions and minimize damage. This is a really timely topic. COVID-19 is impacting the world in many ways, including fraud and identity theft. Online shopping is up 33%. A lot of changes were rolled out in conjunction with COVID, including extending the tax due date, which has created additional trends of calls from people. They're saying they're from the IRS. And finally, unemployment fraud is skyrocketing. In a normal year, you wouldn't see a lot of unemployment fraud because it's a low dollar, high risk crime. However, with the increase in unemployment benefits, people are focusing now on fraud as it relates to unemployment. So let's spend a little bit of time talking about financial identity theft. Financial identity theft is when a criminal uses your personal information to get access to your money or your credit. And this is the most common type of identity theft. With all forms of identity theft, the consequences can be serious, requiring a great deal of time and money to resolve. And when you see the alarming growth, in data breaches, it certainly seems like more of us are at risk. Data breaches are the cases in which a business's or store's sensitive data has been potentially viewed or stolen or used by an individual unauthorized to do so. So I'm sure many of you who are listening to this have heard news about large stores that have had data breaches in the past or large organizations. You've probably even received notification from a company that maybe your data was stolen. It's a frightening statistic, but in 2016, more than 30% of people were involved in data breaches and became victims of identity theft. As you can see in 2017, there were 1,579 data breaches exposing nearly 179 million records, according to the Identity Theft Resource Center. That represents about a 44% increase from 2016 in the number of breaches and a 389% increase in the records that were exposed. And while these incidents get a lot of coverage in the news, it's not the only way thieves get our information. It's often said that it's not a question of whether 
or not, you will be a victim of identity theft, but when you will become a victim of identity theft. There are a lot of ways thieves get our personal information, and we'll talk today about how they use technology. But many still do it the old fashioned way. They simply steal it from your trash, from your mailbox, or maybe they'll take your purse or wallet. So don't think it's only via technology that your information can be exposed. And while all of this may seem overwhelming or even scary, there are a lot of things you can do to help limit your exposure. About 50% of crimes are caught by personal monitoring. So be sure to check your financial statements and balance accounts every month. Check your credit twice a year with one of the three credit agencies. Let's look at the places and ways that we're at risk and what can be done about it. So you can see that statistic there, about 50% of crimes are caught by personal monitoring. I know that um, you know, I switched my statements, my financial statements and credit card statements from snail mail to electronic notifications and email, and I haven't been as good as checking them at, at checking them recently, but it's such an important idea. So even if you are not getting that hard copy statement in the mail, make sure you're taking time each month, setting aside time when you're paying your bills to actually go through your statements with a fine tooth comb, because as you can see, most of these issues are caught by personal monitoring. And how can you protect yourself? So since all of these crimes are not done electronically, how do you protect yourself at home? Store your important documents in a safe place. So your social security cards, birth certificates, car titles, tax returns, insurance policies, put them all in a secure place like a fire safe box, a file cabinet, or even a safety deposit box at your bank. And I'm gonna add one more item to that list based on personal experience. If you pay your bills electronically and, and don't use your checkbook frequently, I would say put that in a fire safe box or in a secure place as well. I had a friend who was selling her home recently and during the walkthroughs when people were visiting her home to determine whether or not they wanted to buy it, somebody took checks out of various sections of her checkbook and she didn't notice it until they cashed the check at the bank. So I would say if you're not using your checkbook frequently, make sure that's in a safe place, especially if your house is on a market and you have people you don't know walking through your home. These can also obtain personal information by going through your mail. Utility bills, financial statements, checks, credit card offers, all contain some personal information, often enough that thieves can easily fill in the blanks. <clears throat> so here's some suggestions. If you don't receive mail for a couple of days, report it to the post office. Pay attention to the delivery dates on your bills and on your statements and consider going paperless. But as I said before, if you go paperless and have these sentence, statements sent electronically, please continue to review them. Opt out of marketing lists and credit card offers, which limit your vulnerability. And always hold your mail if you'll be away for more than a few days. It's really easy to do it online. You can even select a date for them to deliver it when you get back. And finally, use the privacy settings on your home Wi-Fi and set a password for your family's use only. Now, how do you protect yourself when you're away from home? Be aware of your location and avoid insecure areas. For example, an ATM located in a bank lobby is relatively safe. Pay at the pump terminals at a gas station are not always. I think many of us have either personally experienced or know somebody who's experienced credit card fraud at a pay at the pump gas station. Um, my personal rule of thumb there is never to use a debit card at a gas station, and I try to use the same credit card if I'm doing pay at the pump, just to ensure that if I, if I do have a situation of fraud, it's not impacting the credit card that's tied to all of my online shopping and bill paying. Next, protect your PIN. When you enter a PIN, no matter where you are, cover your hand with your other hand. Um, don't accept help. This is one scam that has become more prevalent recently. Um, if somebody's having, if you're having trouble with the ATM machine, don't ask for help. Don't let somebody see you re-enter your information. Either go to a different machine or if you're at the bank, go inside and speak to somebody who works at the bank. Whenever possible, use secure payment methods. I think a lot of us saw this more frequently during lockdown. I know when I was paying for takeout at restaurants, they were looking for payments such as Venmo and, and Apple Pay, but use these secure payment methods whenever 
whenever possible. If something looks odd, walk away and contact your bank immediately if anything strange happens. And don't shop or make financial transactions using public unsecured Wi-Fi. So how to protect what's in your wallet. By some accounts, a thousand purses and wallets are stolen every two minutes in the US. So consider what's in your purse or wallet right now and whether or not you need to carry that with you on an everyday basis. Consider removing information or limiting your cards to just your driver's license, maybe one or two credit cards, your debit card, and then things that won't necessarily have personal information, like maybe your card for the gym or your work ID. Your health insurance card does have some personal information, but is important to keep in your purse or wallet as well. Never leave your social security card in your purse or wallet. Keep it in a secured location. Keep in mind that many stores do not require their actual store credit card when you're shopping there, and they can look up your account with just your driver's license. So the less you carry, the less somebody can carry away. So how to protect yourself on the phone. Um, believe it or not, calling people on the phone is still one of the major ways criminals obtain your personal information. Hang up if someone calls you and asks you to verify account information or clear up a bill. I know this has happened to me personally. I've hung up, I've called the company directly, and they've confirmed that it was fraud. So if it doesn't feel right, hang up and call directly. Other popular scams are asking for a card or bank information for a charitable donation or because you've won a special prize. I had a family member receiving a, receive a call saying her son was arrested and that she needed to wire money to get him out of jail. They knew his name and they knew personal information about, about her son. She was smart enough to text her son and verify that he was fine and okay, but another person might not have had the wherewithal to do that. So again, the best defense is just to hang up. Thieves prey on polite people who stay on the phone. And our mobile phones are a host of personal information. So lock it with a strong passcode so your information is not readily available to a thief. Many of us have either the fingerprint scan technology or facial recognition technology, which is a great way to keep that mobile phone safe. Install track and wipe software, which is software that can automatically wipe your cell phone of its contents remotely. Your wireless carrier may offer this application. If you think you might have to wipe your phone and any of us might be in this situation, you'll wanna back up your phone periodically to your computer. So if your phone is stolen, you can use this capability to wipe your phone clean and it may even track where thieves have taken your phone so that authorities can help you get that back. Sometimes people use this software just to find their phones. I know I've used find my iPhone when I've dropped my phone simply walking the dog. So people use the the capabilities, excuse me, the software for other, uh, other functionality as well. Um, and next we're gonna talk about passwords. And if you're using any of the most common passwords, change them because thieves know this passwords too. And people consistently use common passwords. I've listed on this slide here, the top 10 passwords of 2017, but there's a security and applications service provider called Splash Data who publishes a list of the top passwords every year. Surprisingly, you'll see that people rely on simple one word passwords and patterns. And one of the most important things you can do is to protect yourself is to have a strong password. You want something that's memorable to you, but isn't easy to figure out. And try to use unique passwords across different websites. Don't use the same exact password for every website or application you use. Because then if you use the same password across multiple businesses and one is compromised, the rest are as well. You can create different passwords for low risk sites like news or blog sites, and then use something a little more secure with shopping or financial institution sites. I know that we all have a lot of passwords to remember and it's difficult to keep track of them all. There is software available to track them for you. If you choose to write them down, put that list in your secured location, maybe that fire safe box or that filing cabinet. Please do not write the list down on any notes application on your phone that isn't password protected and could eventually 
be unsecured and uploaded to the cloud. So just be very careful if you're making a list of your passwords, where you're keeping that list. Many experts suggest creating a memorable phrase or sentence, maybe a line from an obscure song or combining some nonsensical words because the number patterns you see on this slide are not gonna be secure. I would be careful about using your children's names or using your pet's names or anything that somebody could figure out if they were trying to figure out what your password was. So, so take a lot of care with selecting your passwords. So how to protect yourself online. Criminals are often using phishing emails to obtain private information. They're using, they're trying to mine for your bank account number, your social security number, or maybe your credit card information. And some of them are really convincing. And they can lure you in by replicating the look of a legitimate website that you trust. Here's some typical characteristics of a phishing email. So you'll see an example on the slide there. There's typically embedded URLs or links. They typically urge you to act immediately. And they threaten a consequence for not responding. So they've got that scare tactic in their email. Oftentimes you'll notice grammatical or spelling errors. And they will replicate a legitimate company logo. So our suggestion is never to click on a link in an email from someone, or if you don't know or aren't confident that it's a legitimate email, hover over the link to see where the link actually takes you before you click on it. Do not ever respond to requests for personal information via email. And periodically run antivirus or malware programs on your computer and set it to auto-update. On your tablets and phones, keep your operating systems and your apps updated in order to keep yourself safe. Again, if you get an email like this and you're questioning the authenticity, feel free to call that company directly and specifically ask them about that email. You have said, we mentioned before about how to keep yourself safe online. And one of the things I mentioned was not using public computers or Wi Fi. So think about coffee shops or public Wi Fi at airports or on trains for any sensitive transactions. Always assume that someone is looking over your shoulder when you're using your computer in public or, or your phone in pub public. If you're sitting on a plane or a train and you've got your laptop out, you can buy a privacy shield on Amazon for about $26.99 and it's worth, a good, it's worth the investment. I've sat next to people on a train or a plane before and you really can't see their screen if you're not supposed to be the person looking at the screen once you've got one of those privacy shields in place. And finally, read your mail from financial institutions when it arrives. These businesses may send out confirmations for account and password changes. So if a change has been made on your account, they will notify you. Now, how to protect yourself with social media. Sav savvy criminals have basic information on you. And a lot of times, then they'll look to social media to fill in the blanks. So for example, if you forget your password and you're looking for it to be reset, you'll get security questions that you created when you established your account. Now you may unknowingly have shared the answers to your, social, to your security questions on your social media account. So think about what have you, your friends, or your family recently posted on social media? Some of the common challenge questions include your birth dates. This information is often on Facebook and LinkedIn and available to your connections in your personal profile unless you've taken a step to suppress this information. Another common challenge question is your hometown or your city of birth. Again, this is information that may be in your personal profile on Facebook, or perhaps you listed the high school you graduated from on LinkedIn or on Facebook. Even if you did not provide this information, a friend may have posted information about a reunion, or maybe you congratulated your hometown sports team on a big win then you unknowingly provided this information to somebody who's looking at your personal information. Pictures of your children's are pets tagged with their names. People often use versions of their children's or pets names and passwords. Your first pet is often a security question, so be careful again about the information you're sharing on social media. We always suggest leaving your relationship status blank. No one needs to know if you're recently single and may be home alone. Be careful about identifying family members on Facebook. If you've identified your mother on Facebook who uses her full name, so for example, if my mother's name was Joan Hill Smith, 
she might do that so her friends who only know her by her maiden name from school can find her. But then, because I've identified her as my mother on my Facebook account, any potential thieves can then find my mother's maiden name. And a lot of financial applications and security questions involve your mother's maiden name. So be very cautious there. And I'm sure all of us on the phone can think of a lot of different examples of the information we're unknowingly providing on social media that can help somebody get information about us and access our accounts. Now, how to protect those people we care about. Uh, children are online more than we are, and it's important to talk to them about risk. Kids love doing fun surveys that will paint, tell them strange things like whether or not they'd survive a zombie apocalypse. Or I saw a survey last week my son was doing that told him what type of bread he was. I don't know why they do these surveys, but they think they're fun. And oftentimes they're, on, they're downloading games that ask for personal information, and they really don't think twice about providing their date of birth or other personal information. And when they're buying things online, they don't think twice about determining whether or not the site is secure. So have these conversations with your kids so that they don't unknowingly expose themselves. Children are being targeted more and more, and it starts the day they're born. So it's not just once they're old enough to be online playing games or doing shopping or completing a survey about what type of bread they are. It's when they leave the hospital with their social security number. If thieves get a hold of their social security number, they can use it to apply for government benefits, to open bank accounts or credit card accounts, or even apply for utility service or rent a place to live. And because we don't think about it, it can go a long time before identity theft would be detected for one of our kids. Many school forms and organizations you get involved with also require personal information and sometimes social security numbers. You can check a credit report to see if your child's information is being misused. So just like you should periodically check your own account, you should also periodically go online just to ensure there's been no accounts established under your child's social security number. But it's not just kids that can be a victim of identity theft. Anyone can fall victim. However, seniors are a key audience for financial exploitation. It's a shocking statistic, but 90% of elder financial abuse is a trusted friend, advisor, or relative, according to the National Adult Protective Services Organization. And financial abuse can, can take many forms. It can be pressure from a friend or a family member to make an uncharacteristic financial decision and provide access to accounts to funnel assets away. Or it can be a phone or online scammer who's trying to convince the individual to pay for fraudulent services or investment schemes. So have these conversations um, with the elderly folks that you care about as well. Convince them to hang up if they're uncomfortable. Have them call you if they need somebody to run something by and encourage them to reach out to those companies directly if they have significant concerns there. Because the earlier the crime is caught, the better. You can purchase programs to help you monitor your credit for around $120 to $300 a year. They'll contact you with any irregularities or verify activity. You can also get a free credit monitoring report from Experience, so you can check your report scores every 30 days. You can also get free dark web scans to see if any of your personal information is already exposed on the web. The key to limiting damage is to act quickly. The first thing to do is to contact any financial, medical, or other institution related to the theft so they can watch for new suspicious activity. Many of us change our passwords at work, on our email system, but we don't change passwords at our bank, our investment companies, our utilities, or other important financial institutions. So try to get in a habit of changing your passwords periodically. Next, contact three credit reporting bureaus and ask them to flag your information with a fraud alert if you believe you were victim of fraud and get copies of those credit reports. If you suspect that somebody stole your social security number, inform both the Social Security Administration and the IRS. If you suspect your identity was stolen through the mail or if a false change of address was issued, contact the Postal Service. And finally, you'll wanna create an identity theft report by filing an identity theft affidavit with the FTC and a police report with your local precinct. And send these letters 
hard copy to document your notifications, or if you're sending something via email, just make sure you have a copy of that so you have something to fall back on. So let's recap how to prevent identity theft. Don't carry personal information with you. Make sure you're shredding information, or if you've been like my kids this summer, throw it in the bonfire at night. Use those strong passwords and change them often. And never give out personal information to strangers via the phone, especially financial information. Detection is the new prevention, so make sure you're monitoring all of your credit reports. Set up fraud reports if you think your data has been compromised. Contact the credit bureaus and make sure that fraud alert lasts for 90 days. It's a free service, so it's worth doing. Freeze your credit, which restricts potential creditors from accessing your credit report and making it harder for thieves to open new accounts in your name. And again, contact each credit bureau. A small fee might be charged to initiate or to lift this freeze on your credit. And be vigilant. You can't prevent 100%, but you can limit the risk for you, your children, um, or your elderly family members. So be alert, understand those threats, and know the signs. In any given day, there are about 50 identity thefts a minute. That would mean in for the 45 minutes that we've been talking, there's been about 2,250 identity thefts that have occurred. My goal here today was to leave you with a better understanding of identity theft and the risks that are out there today. We wanna also leave you with steps that can limit your exposure. So stay aware, limit access, and monitor your accounts. Staying aware and having greater awareness is really important, but so is limiting access. And we've discussed several tactics today that will help frustrate thieves that are trying to access your information. And finally, when it comes to monitoring accounts, we're all on the go, and it's really hard to give each statement the scrutiny it deserves, but it's important to do so. The sooner you find issues, the less damage can be done. And finally, I wanna leave you with some resources that are available. So I've listed the credit reporting agencies here. You can get some free annual credit reports on the website listed. If you wanna minimize your exposure via mail, you can opt out of pre-approved credit card offers and also register with the National Do Not Call program. So if you are getting a call, you'll know it's suspicious if you're on that do not call list. And finally, keep your personal information safe on social media. If you aren't sure how to do so, most of these social media sites do have additional information on how to keep that personal information safe. So I recommend spending a few minutes on that as well. So Rita, with that, that's my content for today. And I'd love to answer any questions if the folks on the phone have any. Thank you so much, Jen, for your insights. I mean, it is amazing, the risk, I mean, how much information you unknowingly provide. I, I, I find it fascinating myself, the things I need to think about. I love the detection is the new prevention um, as well. Yes, we will now open the lines for any questions and I'll check the chat feature. Thank you everyone.